This uh, video is kind of important because we take um, mandibular range of motion measurements on every single TMD patient at every single visit, no exceptions always. Sometimes some, you know, the assistants will come up and say, do we take measurements today? And I say, yes, of course. We, Whenever we have a TMD patient, we take mandibular range of motion measurements. Please understand that's how we keep track of our success of, you know, in treating patients. So this, this video is dedicated to taking accurate mandibular range of motion measurements. And again, the subtitle is Keeping Track of TMD Patient Progress. Most of the time, if something is moving correctly, that means all the parts inside whatever makes it to move are working correctly. So when we take mandibular range of motion measurements and they go from like not so good to very good, we know that the parts within the jaw and around the jaw are healing, or at least they are responding to therapy so people can talk and eat and swallow and do things that they previously couldn't do. We do take these measurements also on um, patients who are having what we call phase two um, uh, treatment. They've gone through TMD therapy and now we're doing some removable orthodontic or orthopedic and we're taking these measurements always at every single visit. I need to know what's going on with my patient. I want as much information as I can get. So the manipular range of motion measurements course is being presented for you by the Atlanta TMD Institute, which I founded in uh, 2018. It will live on after me and it will be focused on, it is focused on education, knowledge and care related to TMD. Uh, its three purposes are to educate dental and medical professionals in TMD, we give courses. Uh, we write to develop knowledge of TMD uh, or temporal manipulative disorders. And again, that's, uh, we haven't entered our research phase yet. We, we, we will be going to as we develop more income to support this thing. Uh, and uh, part of that also is books to provide uh, permanent information for practitioners. And then again, we are a uh, tertiary um, TMD center. So we take care of regular patients, patients that have been treated by dentists, regular dentists, patients that have been treated by other specialists. We, we, everybody comes to us to have things solved. We take a very broad, holistic, uh, or integrative uh, medicine type of viewpoint of TMD, and we try to treat everything. We don't, we're not just plumbers or electricians putting dental appliances in or splints in. We take care of the body and the mind and try to take care of everything related to this disease. I like to be as simple as possible so that you have a full, complete understanding of everything, even all the terms. So inter means between, and we use the example of international, which means between two nations. So international travel, when you get on an airplane, can be from the United States to England, let's say. Uh, you're going from one nation, the United States, to another nation, England, international, or it could be United States and Mexico, which is United States, one nation, Mexico, another nation. Inter means between. I'm going to give you a just a very quick education on the uh, front teeth, anterior teeth. We're going to talk about incisal, which means something to cut, to incise something, means to cut it. So you use scissors to cut something. So the word incisal means the biting edge, the very edge of the scissors of a front anterior tooth. Got it? And so we're... This measurement, the first measurement that we're going to be looking at is called the interincisal measurement. And we'll look at this in just a minute. But we have the upper arch called the maxillary arch because it's in a bone called the maxilla. We have the lower arch, the mandibular arch, because it's in a bone called the mandible. Central means the center of things. So you have the upper arch, 
central incisor. These are the incisor teeth that are flat and cut like scissors. You have the right central incisor and the left central incisor. On the bottom, we have the right central incisor and left central incisor. So we've got the maxillary right central, maxillary left central, upper arch, mandibular right central, and the uh, mandibular left central. Then we have the lateral incisors. We have two of them, one on the right, one on the left on the maxilla, and we have two of them on the bottom. Um, and when, when we are measuring the opening of the bite, we're only concerned about the central incisors. Got it? So we're going to take a measurement from the maxillary central incisor to the mandibular central incisor. You could choose right in the middle if they're even. In this case, the bottom one is not. Uh, but you're, you're measuring from the edge of the upper central incisor to the edge of the lower central incisor. It's, this, is, this is what we're talking about. So this is called a linear measurement, like a line. You can draw a line, right? And if you look at the edge of this Miltex dental ruler, it starts with zero and goes all the way to 65. I've never seen anybody open 65. I've seen people open 55. Um, but the, uh, there are millimeter measurements on this ruler, and it's a uh, it's a brand that I really like. Miltex is a, is a company that manufactures dental products. And this is a Miltex dental endodontic, meaning for root canals, because you're measuring root canal files a lot. So it's a Miltex dental endodontic millimeter ruler. It's stainless steel, so it can be uh, cleaned and sterilized and used patient after patient after the patient. You always have a Miltex dental endodontic millimeter ruler in the operatory for all TMD patients. You should put them in the, it should be in the, uh, on the bracket table, open in front of the patient. It's there every single time. This is your basic tool, very easy tool to take uh, me me measurements of the mandibular movement. So when the patient opens, the front two teeth, the, the bite separates. So in other words, as the lower jaw drops downward, the space between the edge of the upper incisors, the edge, the incisal edge, to the incisal edge on the bottom opens. And then you place your millimeter ruler vertically against, you actually put it on the lower teeth or the upper teeth, uh, and then read where the other edge uh, 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 the number that you get from the other edge. So it is called the inter-incisal measurement. So you, you ask the patient to open as far comfortably. You take the Miltex dental ruler, go vertical, put it on the lower teeth, push it against the upper teeth, and look to see where the edge of the upper uh, touches and read off the number on the Mil Miltex ruler and normal is usually 40 to 50 millimeters. So the normal inter incisal opening measurement is 40 to 50 millimeters. <clears throat> and again, you're going to record this on a stick up or you know a sticky, a post-it, uh, so that I can see it before you write it down permanently because you know there's lots of ways to screw up inter incisal measurements <laughs> and other measurements and I, I feel like this is something that I really I want to be able to check whenever possible because I'm making clinical decisions I'm making choices on what I have to do to this patient very often based upon your measurement so the first one of the most important measurements is the interincisal opening measurement and this is how far the patient opens their mouth and you have to be able to bite into a Big Mac and so you need at least 40 to 50 millimeters to get your mouth open enough to get onto a Big Mac. So again, this is a box uh, with the interincisal opening, and you would fill in this box, right? You, you, you know, you fill in this area. 
And the movement that we're measuring is the interincisal opening. It's measured in millimeters, almost 40 to 50. So you would write down your measurement right there in the middle and compare it to normal. And um, with new practitioners, I'm always, uh, I, I think it's important, you know, is, it, is it painful to open? You know, and say yes or no. And as we treat patients, it's no, because they can open. At first, it might be yes. Um, but the, but the interincisal opening should be 40 to 50. You record it. You compare what the normal numbers. I always like having the n normal numbers there so you can remember what's normal, what's not normal. As you become expert, you know, as when we're treating patients, we don't put down the normal numbers because we know them. We, and we see, you know, 10, 20 TMD patients a day. We know what normal is because uh, we're measuring all the time, all our patients. So as we continue with mandibular range of motion measurements, we're going to talk a little bit about some important terms, some important things that you should know. And it's very important. <laughs> and the first is maxillary. That means the upper arch in the maxilla, the bone called the maxilla. Dental meaning teeth. We're talking only about teeth, not about the skeleton. You see, because if you, you can think of the teeth like a denture, you can make a denture and it could be canted to the left or it could be canted to the right or it could be forward or back. The, the denture itself is, is changing, but the maxilla is not. So you can be moving teeth around without moving bone around. So we're talking dental. We're looking at teeth and we're particularly looking at the right and left maxillary, central incisors. Got it? Focus on what I just say. Look at that, that picture to the right. Mid is the middle. A line is a up-down line. So we have a, the two maxillary central incisors. They touch each other on what we call the mesial. So the right mesial and left mesial are touching each other. And we can make a vertical line up and down. And that is the midline, dental midline because it, it might not be down the center of the nose <laughs> or the center of the eyes, uh, but it is the dental midline. Dental, again, I'm stressing, teeth, teeth, teeth. This has to do with teeth, the dental midline. So again, we have the maxilla, which is the upper teeth, and then we have mandible, which is lower teeth. And you'll also notice that the mandibular central incisors are much smaller than the maxillary. And that has to do with the upper arch has to be bigger and it has to go over and grab over the bottom teeth. Got it? And they say overbite, biting over something. I'm biting the upper arch bites over the lower. So we call that overbite. Got it? Very important. But you also have a mandibular dental midline. Now these are two separate things. The maxillary dental midline is one line that you get from the maxillary central incisors. Now we have a mandibular central uh, incisor dental midline, right? And so that's a line. You can see that black line now going up and down. It touches between the two mandibular central incisors. The L stands for lateral incisors, C for central incisors, and there's a line. Very important. This concept is very important because when you're taking measurements, it's really easy when the maxillary dental midline and the mandibular med dental midline, both of those lines overlap each other exactly up and down, easy to take measurements. But if the maxillary dental midline and the mandibular dental midline are not exactly the same, it gets more difficult. And I'm gonna tell you, this is where you're gonna be making some mistakes. And it happens even with experienced uh, dental assistants. Uh, they just don't always pay attention. So I'm teaching you this so that you'll start paying attention. Ask these questions when you do these measurements. So I'm, I'm stressing that you have to compare the midlines of the upper and the lower before you do any measurements so you won't make any errors. You'll see this in a little bit. In this particular case, the two central incisors of the maxilla, the two maxillary central incisors midline, and the mandibular central incisors midline 
they match. It's one line because they're both right over each other. You can't see two lines because they're right on top of each other. They're matched. So we're measuring the directions of movement of the lower jaw. The lower jaw is moving away from the maxilla, the maxillary teeth, and then it's moving towards it. But it also moves right and left. So the first measurement interincisals up and down, right? And then the second um, uh, measurement is lateral. La the word lateral means to the side. I'm going laterally to my right side, laterally to my left side. And we are now going to look at two measurements, right lateral and left lateral. Got it? So very important. First thing, person bites down into their bite. That's called their maximum inter cuspation. Maximum means the most. Inter, again, you learn between cuspation, the two cusps of the hills, they fit together, and that's so that they, you can chew and rip. But they bite down, they go into a bite, that's the bite that you look at, you have them hold that for a moment, and then you look at their midlines. So here we go, we're going to do a left lateral. So we're facing the patient, got it? First thing is, uh, uh, we assume that the maxillary and the mandibular uh, midlines, dental midlines match on this particular case. So let's let's take a look. So if you have the cent the 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 central incisors, and we have a midline, and if you look, the lower jaw, the centrals have moved to the left. Got it? You're you're get this, very important that you look at this. So we, they used to match the midline, CC on the bottom, the, the matched, and now it moved over to the left, and there is a, the two lines, the two dental midlines have shifted, and there's a difference in the two dental midlines, you measure them, and that's, in this particular case, it's 10 millimeters to the left, got it? So the lower jaw, which used to be the upper midline and the lower midline matched, but now that lower midline, the line up and down, has shifted to the left 10 millimeters. You would place your millimeter ruler at the maxillary central, right midline, place it horizontally against there, make it, and then read off the, from the, read off the number that you see that is the mandibular midline. So you read it off, put the ruler horizontal, and just take it, take the measurement. Good, so, you know, first thing you did, study, 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 you're now a scientist, you're an educated uh, professional. Before you do your midline, before you do your mandibular motion measurements, your mandibular range of motion measurements, you, you know, have the patient bite all the way down, hold it, you look to see, is the maxillary midline matching the mandibular midline? If you say, yes, it's easy. So if it does match, your measurements are easy. So when the maxillary and mandibular dental midlines match, which you check before you are doing your measurement, just always measure the movement of the mandibular midline from the maxillary midline. Got it? So you're actually putting the ruler on the maxillary midline horizontally right there, and then you can just see how far the jaw moved, the, the, the mandibular midline moved to the left or to the right, and you simply read off. And you're going to need, well, I need glasses with a lot of light. So be sure that you put the, uh, the dental light straight in there. And you, if you have to wear glasses, wear glasses because you need to sharply see the millimeter measurements, because you're taking, this is a very precise thing. Fortunately, most of the, the midlines match, uh, probably you know, 50%, 60% match. But you get into trouble, this is where you make your mistakes. That's why you've got to be very intellectual. You have to be disciplined step by step by step. When you're doing something, you have to pay attention. A lot of people think, oh, this is no big deal. Uh, I can just go in and measure, and you'll make some major errors, and it will lead to incorrect conclusions and treatment, you know, 
might complicate the treatment. We might think the patient's normal when they're not normal, or we might say they're abnormal when they're not abnormal. So this is very important. So now we have a situation you've gone in before you started your measurements and you notice that the maxillary midline and the mandibular midline do not match. So now you're screwed because it is not as easy to make these measurements. You can't make them with the midlines because they don't match, all right? So when the maxillary and mandibular dental midlines do not match, always measure the movement of the mandibular midline Remember, the maxillary midline doesn't move. The mandibular one is the one that's shifting around. The lower jaw moves. So the mandibular midline moves. So again, when the maxillary and mandibular dental midlines do not match, always measure the movement of the mandibular midline from a pencil mark made on the maxillary teeth. So you have the patient bite down. You see they don't match. Oh, my Lord. Take a pencil. And right above the mandibular midline, make a mark on the central incisor. That is where you're making your measurements from because you don't have matching measurements because that's where the mandible started, at that pencil mark, not at the central mark. So again, always measure the movement of the mandibular midline from a pencil mark made on the maxillary teeth right above the mandibular dental midline. Very important. So you should always have, again, not only a Miltex millimeter ruler, but a sharpened number two lead pencil uh, available on the uh, bracket table uh, so that when you're doing this, all your equipment's right there so that you don't have to be running around like an idiot. All right, so let's examine this diagram showing the midlines not matching. This person is not moving laterally at all. They're not going right or left. They're in their maximum intercuspation. So before you start taking any measurements, you have them bite down and you look to see what's going on because the patient is biting down right now. And you'll notice, first thing, the, the, the maroon maxillary dental midline, there it is, up and down. But wait a minute, the mandibular dental midline is off to the left. Right? Do you see this? So look at the two centrals, where they contact together on their mesial surfaces, right? That's a problem. It's not centered. The two midlines are not centered. So I have a, a vertical arrow, and that is the position that you make a vertical mark with a pencil. So you actually put a pencil mark because that is where the mandible started. Do you got it? you have to measure the starting point of the mandible, a mandible from the place that it is beginning. Got it? It's very important. If you use, let's say that is two millimeters shifted to the left. So the mandibular midline is to the left. The maxillary is in the center, but now you've got a problem because there's a two millimeter discrepancy. That is going to throw off all your measurements by two millimeters. <clears throat> so you've got to not use the, 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 the central incisor maxillary midline simply because it will throw off all your measurements. So you put a pencil mark on the upper maxillary left central here, vertical, and that's where you measure from. You put your ruler to that. You don't put your ruler in the central incisor midline in the maxillary because it, that, they don't match. All right, in this illustration, I am showing a purple vertical line, which is the mandibular lower jaw midline, dental midline. Got it? And this illustrates I'm trying to really press into your head these two midlines, and they don't match because the, 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 the vertical line on the maxillary, which was maroon in the previous slide, and the purple one, for the lower, they don't match. They're not overlapping. You can see both of them because when they overlap, you can't only see one, right? When they when they are different, they're separated and they're separated to two different lines that do not match. And again, I'm pounding, pounding, pounding on this because I want you really to get it. So I'm beating this dead horse. <laughs> You're probably thinking, Dr. P, come on, give me a break. I got it, I got it. But 
I've got to make sure you got it because when you do your measurements, you're going to make errors if you don't notice these discrepancies. So again, when the maxillary dental midline and the mandibular dental midline do not match, they don't overlap on each other, there is a horizontal, which means laying sideways, not up and, up and down as vertical, horizontal side to side, there is a horizontal discrepancy, right? And you can measure that in millimeters. And that error might, if you use the dental midline incorrectly, when they don't match, you're going to have an error that's going to total this discrepancy. Got it? Just remember, if the maxillary dental midline and mandibular dental midline do not match, and you use the maxillary midline from your measurements, you're going to get an error, and the error is going to amount to this horizontal discrepancy in millimeters. So again, you know, the midlines do not match. This is the diagram showing it. Whenever the midlines don't match, automatically use a pencil. You see I have a vertical line saying pencil mark. Put a pencil mark on the upper left incisor or the upper right if it's shifted to the right. But put a pencil mark above the mandibular midline onto the upper teeth. And that's where you measure from. Enough said. Maybe we'll get into this a little later about the errors, how you'll understand it. But it, I just want you to be a good technician and just say, okay, do the med dental midlines match? Yes, I'm using the central incisor midline, maxillary central incisor midline for my measurements, my starting point. Starting point, I put the ruler on there to start. If, however, the dental midlines do not match, I'm going to make a pencil mark above the mandibular midline, wherever it might be, and I'm going to use that. I'm going to put my ruler on that pencil mark horizontally, and that's my starting point. So taking lateral measurements is the same, except one's to the left and one's to the right. Got it? This is very important, and we'll get into later why we do right and left, because it tells us something about the joints. It tells us about the muscles, and we're going to go over that in a little bit as I get more involved in, in teaching you how the jaw joint works. So again, we have a box here, a table. We got movement. We do the right lateral movement in millimeters. We do the left lateral movement in millimeters. Guess what? It's millimeters. Why? We're using a millimeter rule. We're using the Miltex endodontic millimeter ruler. What is normal? You should always, when you're taking a measurement, you say, is this normal? Is this not normal? Normal is 8 to 10 millimeters. Normal is 8 to 10 millimeters. We want that. That's what our goal is when we set out. Most TMD patients do not have 8 to 10 millimeters to start. Seriously, sometimes 4, sometimes 5 or 6, but they can't move left or right. Sometimes they can move better to one side than the other side, and this means something, and we'll get into that. And then when you're first starting out, if you're not a specialty practice, and you know, we want you to set, see if there's pain on these movements. So it, does that hurt to move to the right? Yes, pain. Does that hurt to move to the left? Yes, pain, X. So, uh, so you, 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 you record this also. So in our, can, you know, our measurement in the mandible movement, it moves downward and upward. That's up and down. That's the vertical axis. It moves left and right, right? That's like a, a rotation. You're rotating to the left, rotating to the right, left and right. And now we're going to do the pro means forward, intrusive means movement, push forward, the forward back movement. Got it? And this is a little more complicated. Let's think about this. Uh, a minute, we're going to look at this diagram because the diagram is going to give you a lot of understanding. This is the side view. You can't see this because there's, the teeth are all touching each other. You can't see it, but you should be able to, in your mind, envision it and put it in your head. And this is one reason why when the dental emission tests um, are given, they have a 3D section where people have to be able to look in their head and twist things around and see things because dentists have to have 3D. But this is the upper central incisor and it's angled normally. It's like a 140 degree angle between the lower and the upper. But 
the lower central incisor is touching up on the back inside of the maxillary central incisor. Do you see this? So the point that it touches, it's not at the incisal edges. Remember we talked about moving incisal edges. So the incisal edge of the lower central incisor is inside the maxillary central. They're not the same point. So if you look at the line A, there's a dot, whereas, and there's a dot to the right, there's two dots. In order for the incisal edges to match, the lower jaw has to slide forward a couple millimeters, and as it slides forward, the, uh, the edges begin to match. But it takes a millimeter or two of forward movement of the lower incisor for the millimeters edges, for the edges to match. So protrusive is a straightforward measurement. And let's just review protrusive in more detail. You'll notice that most teeth, not all, the bottom central incisor touches the back of the upper central incisor. It's behind it. So in order for the uh, lower central incisor, which is on the mandible, which moves, it has to go forward maybe one or two millimeters before it gets to be edge to edge. Then finally it moves forward even more beyond the tip of the upper central incisor. And that is another two, three millimeters. So you've got two measurements when you're taking protrusive one, which is A, from the bite position to edge to edge. So you get a measure of that, right? That's over jet. And then from the central incisor beyond tip to tip and, and B, add them together. And that's how you get the protrusive. It's actually two numbers. So something I really, 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 really need to make sure you understand is protrusive is not an interincisal measurement. So when you have opening, it's interincisal. Got it? To the incisor, to the incisor, edge of the incisor, sizal edge. Protrusive is two movements, incisor to incisor forward, incisor to incisor backward. Got it? So there's two, A and B. It's not interincisal. That's important because I do get people who incorrectly measure protrusive. So let's do a summary in a little box here for the range of motion measurements. You've already been uh, presented. I didn't talk about protrusive, but protrusive is a variation and it's just a weird measurement. Uh, there's, I don't, not, I don't even want to quote an average. It could be two, it could be four, ten. You know, I, they it varies. But again, interincisal opening is normal, forty to fifty, painless. Right and left laterals, eight to ten, painless. And protrusive, it varies. You know, two to ten, let's say. But I can't even put down a normal range because there isn't one, right? And it also is painless. I really think that the mandibular main range of motion measurements are critical. I check them every single time a TMD patient comes in. I think it's critical and it's put on the TMD patient self-evaluation form, but we, you, the assistant, does not do not write this directly. You use a post-it, right, or a, a, a yellow sticky if it's a generic so you take one of these yellow stickies off and you put it on the top right side and you put, you know, LL, left lateral, eight, RL, right lateral, you know, nine, uh, O for maximum opening, 48, whatever. You put them on there. I check them. I think it's that critical because I, I actually use, um, I use these measurements to see progress. And what's very interesting, and I will tell you right now, since we're talking about mandibular range of motion, 
the mandibular range of motion will improve sometimes tremendously before the patient starts feeling better. So listen, so they are able to move well rather quickly, but then they haven't healed. The muscles have not recovered, the ligaments have not recovered, and it takes a little time for them to get better. And this is very important. And I know when I see improved mandibular range of motion and the patient's complaining that they're still hurting, I know they're gonna get better and I can reassure them, you're gonna be fine, you're starting to move wonderfully. You went from not being able to move your jaw to a wonderful range of motion. You know, now that it's moving fine, it's gonna start healing and it will take a little time. And sometimes I'll recommend heat therapy, they'll put heat and then they'll increasing the range of motion. We have a couple of handouts on this to increase the range of motion. Uh, you know, have, I want them to exercise their jaw. I want to, you know, if you exercise, you feel better, right? So I want heat on there to increase the blood flow to the structures, particularly the muscles. But put it on the post up because I do check these every single time before the patient comes in, before I see the patient. So again, please understand, every time the patient comes in, they do a TMD patient self-evaluation form. I measure this every single time. This has been one of the big things that I've added into my practice because I like to see, it, those measurements tend to tell me if things are going well. So if all the measurements are wonderful and the patient's complaining, there may be a cervical problem, right? There may be some sort of a neck issue, there might be still some residual pain referrals to the face, to the joint, to the, you know, and, and there's lots of things going on. But if they're moving well, they're probably well, dentally, you know, as far as the TMD goes. And I've got to deal with other things. I have to deal with nighttime problems, you know, sleep problems, other things. So, you know, I've got to look at all of this information, but I base a lot of decisions upon these measurements. I measure progress and I also know, do I have to run in there and use my brain to figure out what's going on with this patient? Have they been progressing? So if they go six weeks and I don't see a great response, I'm going to spend more time sitting with that patient, figuring things out, examining the patient, interviewing the patient, touching the patient to figure out that, well, gee, all the things I've been doing aren't working as well as I want. Now I have to kick in and accelerate treatment to look at other issues. Got it? So it's very important. And you bring this sticky on the right hand corner, upper right hand corner of the TMD self evaluation form to me wherever I am in the office. So the patient might be in one operatory, operatory one. You've done these millimeter measurements, you've gone through the TMD patient self evaluation form correctly, and there's a whole course on that. And you bring it to me and you shut your mouth. It is against the law to talk about one patient in front of another patient. That's a HIPAA violation, Health Insurance Portability and Privacy, Privacy Act. So please don't go opening your mouth in front of other patients. But what you do is you take the measurements, you go through, make sure the form is filled out, make sure the referring doctor's on there, make sure the patient name is on there, the date is on there, the patient has filled out everything. And then, and then in the bottom, it says that they've gone to physical therapy, all this stuff, you gotta do this. This is part of your job in helping me. And then wherever I am in the office, you um, even if I'm with another patient, you kind of walk in quietly, you have the board, I see it, I know what that is, you don't have to tell me. Well, Susie Jones is in op one and she's a TMD patient. Why are you saying this to me? I know when you have this TMD self-evaluation form, with the millimeter measurements on the sticky, that that's the TMD patient. I'm gonna look at that, I'm gonna make decisions. Do I get, need to get in there right away and spend some time? Or is she doing great? Because if she's doing great, most likely, you know, I'm not gonna be in there very long, got it? But again, the post that is on the top right-hand side, it is on the TMD self-evaluation form. You bring that to me non-verbally, you do not open your mouth or talk. Please don't, please don't, please don't talk, talk, talk in front of another patient. Boy, it's so upsetting. 
But I still, despite me telling people, don't do that, people will walk in and say things that they're not supposed to say. So you're not supposed to give information about one patient to another. So be quiet. There you go. Okay, this is a side view or a sagittal view. You know, I got the articular disc, TMD disc, in red. It's probably a little too far back. It should be a little more forward and down. But this is maximum intercuspation, bitten all the way down, can't bite up any higher. And the articular disc is in the correct place. The, the upper bulge is supposed to be right above the condyle. It's a little too far back. And it fills in that space and goes down forward. And when we take an x-ray, it is radiolucent or black. All right. So the jaw joint, human jaw joint, temporal mandibular joint, makes two types of movements. And the first one is rotation. And you already know what rotation is, but we're going to review it so that you understand what this joint is doing. So here's a bicycle wheel. Do you see the bicycle wheel? And we know that the bicycle wheel rotates. So a wheel turns around its axle, right? Or axis. Uh, and there's the bicycle axle. And the wheel turns around one way, either clockwise or counterclockwise. It, but it turns, that axle never moves. It stays in place. The, the bike, so if you pick the bike up off the ground, spin the wheel, the wheel will turn, 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 but the bike won't move because the wheel itself is spinning on the axle without moving. And that's how the temporal mandibular joint acts for the first 25 millimeters or so when it's opening. It just spins open in a circle. So there you go, this particular spin, and we got the arrow and the line, it's going counterclockwise, but it's staying in place. In other words, we're not on the ground, we're picking the bicycle up just a little bit, and the wheel is spinning, it's turning. So please pay attention, this is kind of critical. If you wanna know how the numbers work, you need to know how the jaw works. So we, in here, we have the, the articular disc. It's between the temporal bone on the top and, it, and the condyle below, like a sandwich. But notice on the condyle, we have a little dot. I don't even know what color it is, maybe blue. And that dot is like the axle, got it? And the mouth has opened. Please notice that the teeth are apart. So it's rotated open like a bicycle going clockwise. Got it? The disc is in the same place. So let's think about this. So the bone of the condyle is rotating and sliding on the disc, but the disc is in the same place. The disc does not move. So the disc is touching the temporal, the top part of the mandibular fossa. That's the dome. It's sitting there. It's not moving. And the, the jaw, the condyle, is turning, rubbing, turning on the bottom part of the disc. But the disc itself is not moving, right? Again, I'm repeating this over and over and over again. The disc is not moving, but the jaw is opening into an, an axle. All right, so let's take a look at this rotation. Please, there's a dot on the condyle. It's blue or green. And that is where it rotates. It rotates as the, so the jaw is opening, see the arrows going down? So the jaw is like a bicycle wheel, it's rotating on the axle or axis, which is that dot, and the disc is not moving, and the condyle is rotating underneath on the bottom of the articular disc. So again, it's rotation opening, the articular disc is in the correct place, and it stays in that place, it doesn't move, there is no articular disc movement at all. It stays right there. And the lower jaw and the condyle, it's like rotating against the disc. So what is rotation when you think about it? It's just like a door. It's like there are four hinges on these two doors. I missed one big door, but two panels. Two, it's actually two doors, right? Two handles, four hinges. The hinge rotates. So got it? So the door is like the, the jaw. And as the door rotates on the hinges, 
It's just like the mandible does. It's rotating down and back. So when we're evaluating the interincisal opening or maximum opening, we're thinking about what is happening inside the joint as we open. And rotation, as I said, is the first part of the opening. Patients rotate, then they, they do another thing we'll talk about, translate. A second thing happens after rotation. But patients usually rotate their mandible, right? Their mandibles open to about 25 millimeters. Kind of memorize that. So if someone comes in and they're opening 40, you know that they're rotating and they're translating. But if they're under 25, there's a problem. You know, they're, they're not translating. They're just rotating. And even if someone has joint damage, they can almost always rotate 25 millimeters open. And, and we'll go over what all that means and I'll get, I'll get you more familiar with what's happening and how to diagnose certain things uh, based upon looking at measurements. So you take a maximum opening, interincisal opening, it's only 15, it's just rotating. It goes up to 25, it's just rotating. It goes 25 to 40, wait a minute, something else is going on, we're gonna talk about that, that's translation. Now there are other reasons that mandibles don't open, muscle spasm and shortening, but I want you to be thinking about these numbers. So in your head, you're thinking, what is happening inside the joint? Is this a joint problem or is this a muscle problem? And we're gonna kind of go over these things. So there is a little bit of a problem going on here. Here we have a young lady and she opens her mouth rotation She's going to rotate about 90 degrees. Guess what happens? She's in her neck and she's going to die because that, that will squeeze her. So God doesn't allow for pure rotation because if you rotated solely, you would go into your neck and you'd have some problems. Every time you eat, you choke yourself. Got it? So you usually you're not going to rotate into your neck. Well, not usually. You don't. So at about 25 millimeters rotation, the jaw starts going forward, not just rotating, but sliding forward in order to avoid hitting the neck with your chin or your lower jaw. So I'm going to introduce a new term here, and I mentioned it before. I hate introducing terms without defining them and telling you what they are, but now we're back, going backward and defining what it is. So after rotating about 25 millimeters, the mandible starts to get close to the neck, and that's a problem, isn't it? The mandible then moves forward or slides forward away from the neck to avoid accidentally pushing on the front of the neck. The sliding forward motion is not rotation. It is bodily movement like a truck moving forward a few feet. This movement is called translation. Got it? So you have rotation for the first 25 millimeters, and from 25 to 40 to 50, you have translation, and that's a bodily movement. And we're gonna look at that in the diagram now. All right, so here we have, it's not rotation. Remember you saw the, the circular lines at the center or the axle or axis. Now the condyle has slid forward out of place. It's taken the articular disc with it, if it's normal, right? The articular disc will come forward. The articular disc stays on top of the condyle like a football helmet on a football player. It slides forward or baseball cap. Uh, and the whole jaw is sliding forward. Got it? So the, where, where is it going? See where the arrow is? The translation is down and forward. The condyle and the articular disc both move down and forward together. We call that sometimes tethered. In other words, that disc is on the condyle like a helmet. It's tied in with, with ropes called ligaments. And the ligaments are made of collagen and they're kind of like clotheslines. They are not supposed to be stretched. When they're stretched, the clothesline is no good anymore. 
Uh, but this is another issue. But right now we're looking at a normal joint. A normal joint translates forward, brings the articular disc with it, and um, this is considered normal. And it translates to avoid the neck. So, you know, we looked at the barn door rotation or the, the, the rotation of the, the double door we looked at earlier, the red door. This is not the same thing. This is more sliding back and forth, much like this shower door. It slides back and forth, or many houses will have back doors out to the backyard that are sliding doors. They don't open and rotate, they slide. So the first 20 to uh, the first 25 millimeters is rotation, and then 25 to 40 or 50 is translation, sliding. So again, I'm repeating this over and over and over again because I want you to get it. I want you to be a pro. I want you to understand everything that's going on. So after only rotating, in other words, just rotation, sole rotation, after only rotating up to 25 millimeters, the mandible starts translating down and forward from the 25 millimeter mark millimeter opening and it opens even wider now to 40 but from 25 to 40 it is translating got it very important this is we're simplifying a lot of this it's more complicated if you think of it this way you're going to understand much of what's going on when you look at your measurements so again we're beating a dead horse the interincisal opening measurement, which is the opening where you put the Big Mac in the mouth, the interincisal measurement will be 25 millimeters or less when the patient is only rotating. And they cannot translate because if they could translate, they would open wider than 25. Got it? All right, so when we're talking about maximum interincisal opening it's an easy straight measurement it's easy to understand but lateral movements are a little more complicated to understand what's happening because two different things are happening in the two different joints when you move lateral got it let's think about it so you got this mandible you're facing someone and the person wants to move to the left so the left joint actually stays in place and rotates in a horizontal direction but the right joint that translates so we're going to do this in a diagram form in a minute but i'm giving you a rule in order for the mandible to move laterally let's say to the left the opposing temporal middle joint the right joint must be able to translate correctly it has to be on the surface of the wheel so as the wheel rotates it rotates on its axle. If I'm moving to the left, the left joint is the axle because the right joint is moving on the wheel. But the movement on the edge of the wheel is not a rotation, it's a translation, it's moving forward. Uh, we're gonna do this in a diagram in a minute, but I'm gonna repeat this over and over again, and hopefully you'll get it. In order for the mandible to move laterally, the opposing temporal mandibular joint must be able to translate correctly in the direction of the lateral movement, which is the opposite, got it? So if the right joint is translating, it's moving to the left. If the left joint is translating, it's moving to the right. And I'm gonna show it to you in a simple diagram so that you can understand it. So on the right hand side, you have all the teeth in the front of the mandible. You got the body of the mandible. And as you go to the very end, right side, we're looking down now. This is the lower arch. That right condyle, you see it? And then the left condyle on the real uh, lower jaw. But I'm going to use a diagram instead. So it'd be easier to look at the diagram rather than the mandible. So I've driven, I drew a ball for the left condyle another ball for the right condyle, and then I get this arch, which represents the lower jaw. And there's a little up and down line at the dental midline, the mandibular dental midline. And we're gonna use this diagram to explain translation and rotation.
All right. So we're going to learn about the left lateral movement. Remember, we're measuring that. It's 8 to 10 is the normal. Let's look at that left movement. We'll first start with the left, uh, left condyle. That's the axle. It's kind of like rotation, like your wheel. It is not going forward. It is not translating. It's kind of pivoting like an axle. The right condyle, wait a minute, the original position is no longer, it's moved forward from its original uh, position. So it's moved forward, we know it's translating. Now something very fine to understand, this is if you really know what you're doing, that condyle is translating forward and away from the translation joint, the original joint. It's actually not going just straight. The arrow is looking straight, but it's actually moving to the left. Uh, the whole thing is moving to the left, not straight. Got it? So in order to make a left movement, see in the top it says move to the left. The lower jaw rotates on its left condyle, and it translates on its right. So the, in order to make a left movement, the right condyle has to translate. The left condyle acts as an axle or axis of rotation. So to summarize this, the right mandibular condyle must translate down, forward, and to the left when you make a left mandibular movement or a left lateral. And you're taking that 8 to 10 millimeter measurement. We hope 8 to 10. That's normal. All right. So to summarize, the left mandibular condyle translates to the right when you make a right mandibular movement. And that's the opposite arrangement. When you're making a left mandibular movement, the right mandibular condyle translate. Hopefully, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take my fist, put it in front of my ear on the right side, take my fist, put it on the left in front of my ear, and then I'll move my right uh, fist forward and to the left, bring it back, left fist to the right, bring it back, kind of, I can feel my, I can move my jaw too if I want to. It can be kind of fun. Yeah, we, we have to have fun in life, don't we? So I'm going to introduce another term. Some dentists say that the translating mandibular condyle, which is the opposite one, is orbiting, orbit, orbiting like each of the planets, including the Earth, orbit around the sun. You can see the blue planet there. It's third from the outside. That's our planet, guys. This is what the condyle is doing on the opposing side. It is orbiting because it's not quite translating forward. It's translating in and forward, kind of like the same way a planet orbits around the sun. Well, I, you know, I think that you should spend a little time thinking about what do these measurements mean? How do they? How do we get to that eight millimeter lateral? What what's going on in the person's mouth? You need to know that because if it's abnormal, you're going to start thinking, what is the problem with the patient right now? So you can make decisions. You know, is it a joint problem? Is it a muscular problem? And that, that the, these measurements point to, to one or the other right now. There are other ways to see other problems that we'll be using, but we're concentrating today on mandibular range of motion measurements. What do they mean? And we're going to look at how the joint works so that you can see um, why these normal measurements come about, how they come about. We're just going to be making a bunch of statements and you just have to memorize them and then later you'll break out how they come about. So if the right lateral measurement and the left lateral measurement, both of the lateral measurements are both above eight millimeters, eight to 10, this means that the patient has normal temporal mandibular joints in most cases, all right? There's very few exceptions, but if it moves well, it's well, right? So if you have a broken leg, you can't move well. And there's a statement that you deviate or shift to the affected side that's a problem. So you'll see this reflected in the millimeter measurements. So if, if those, I have to make that statement, 
If it moves eight or 10, right and left, both, those the joints are normal. So if there's a problem opening, for example, that means that's probably not the joint that's causing it. It's probably muscles. There's probably muscle problems, tightness, hasn't uh, relaxed yet for whatever reason. There's lots of reasons, including sleep problems, nighttime bruxism, uh, uh, and other parafunctional habits. Para means outside of, like chewing on pencils, right, or tongue thrusting, other things that we need to look at because these are critical. These are, these are really critical, and we have to look into, whoa, the measurements are normal, the joints are normal, but the patient's in pain. Something else is going on, kids. So we'll take a look at that. So one of the most common things that we do see is a combination of measurements that reflect a certain problem. Well, let's look at it. So if the interincisal opening is limited, so what would limited be? Normal interincisal is what? You should memorize that 40 to 50. So the person comes in with a 32 opening. You have to say, well, is that because of damage in the joint, right? Or is that a muscle problem? Because if you're muscle bound, you cannot stretch, right? When muscle bound, when you're muscle bound, you cannot stretch. So if the patient's been grinding, 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 and the muscles are so tight that they can't relax, the patient can't open, right? But the joints might be normal. So if the interincisal opening is limited, under 40, and the right lateral and the left lateral measurements are normal, 8 to 10, this patient probably has an elevator muscle tightness or elevator muscle tightness. Rarely is it just one. So the masseter and the medial pterygoid, they're matched. The masseter is on the outside of the jaw. The medial pterygoid is on the inside of the jaw. They are both facing each other, and they both work together to jam upward and chew. So when the masseter and medial pterygoid, the masseter is the beaver muscle for chewing, 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 you don't see the medial pterygoid because it's inside the mouth, deep inside the back of the jaw. The temporalis muscle on the side of the head, you see that, and that is always, that's the most common sign with TMD. That particular muscle is on the side of the head, and when it gets into trouble, it particularly in the anterior portion, it, it gets, the muscle hurts, and you get a deep, aching headache. And fortunately, it is often misdiagnosed as, as what? What? Migraine. But it's not, and it's TMD. Not always, but very often. It's, it, and, and they say you're supposed to diagnose common things commonly. And the American Headache Society, International Headache Society says, absolutely, the most common headache is muscular skeletal, right? So that should be the first diagnosis. Then it, when that's excluded, then we go to migraine. But if the intercisal open is eight to 10, right and left, I mean, uh, is limited, and the, and the right and left laterals are normal, probably this person has elevator muscle tightness. They're grinding on their teeth, and the, muscle, the grinding is hyper-exercising, like lifting weights, and they're becoming muscle-bound, and they can't open their jaw because the muscles won't relax. All right, so now we're looking, not just measuring the interincisal opening, we're watching the lower jaw, and does it open straight up and down? See, does it open straight up and down? See the arrow? The line is like vertical, and it goes straight down. So let's make a statement. Now that you know about rotation and translation, when they first open 25 millimeters, they're rotating. It should be straight up and down line. And then as they open from 25 to 40, they are all, they're translating, and they're going up and down straight on both sides. So again, watching the patient from the front, a normal mandible opens symmetrically, even on both sides, and in a straight downward line, when both mandibular condyles rotate and translate normally. Got it? Hope you're getting that now that you're understanding what's going on with the joints. You're looking at the teeth, but you know what's going on with the joints based on how the teeth move. So I'm introducing a new term, and the term is called deflection. And deflection, deflection is when one condyle cannot translate at all. 
and as a result, the movement of the jaw is a straight line to the side of the damaged condyle. In medicine, we say you deviate to the affected side. You deviate to the affected side, but here the term is deflection. And as the person opens, it goes in a straight line all the way to the side of the damaged condyle. So the opposite side is rotating and translating normally, but the damaged side is just rotating and you get this straight line when they open. So the maxillary and mandibular dental midlines used to match, but this patient is opening and they have a left side deviation, got it? Which means their left condyle is only rotating and not translating, got it? But the right condyle is, but this person's just trying to open their mouth. They're not trying to move to the left. When they open their mouth, they move to the left. They're not trying to make a left. They have to make a left. Got it? And this is called deflection to the left. It's a straight line to the left that does not come back to the middle. Got it? Very important. All right, so this is the same thing, except the right condyle is damaged. It can rotate, but it cannot translate. And this person is trying to open straight, and they can't. Got it? It's a little different from, and, and when we see the opening, notice that these teeth are separated a great deal. We're not taking a lateral movement, which the teeth will be close to each other. But just, this is, please open your mouth, and they open, you tell the patient, please open your mouth. They open their mouth, and their jaw moves to the right. That is a deflection. It's a straight line, doesn't go to the center. Got it? Straight line to the side of the affected joint or damaged joint. So again, in summary, deflection means a specific thing. It means that one joint is only rotated, cannot translate. Deflection is movement of the mandible to one side in a straight line without ever returning back to the midline. Got it? Deflection. And that's on opening. All right, so now we're moving on to deviation. And we said that deviation is where it opens, does strange things, but always goes back to the midline. So we look at this pathway, it's starting to deflect to the right side. But wait a minute, it's not a straight line, is it? Deflection is a straight line. This is not a straight line. So it starts to deflect to the right side, and all of a sudden something happens, it returns. All right, let's go over this. The right joint cannot translate at first. So it's stuck, and as it, oh, as the patient opens, it is deflecting to the right, but then the disc pops back on to the condyle. So an anteriorly displaced disc without reduction, a disc that does not jump back onto the head, of the, the helmet back on the head, it will prevent movement forward. So an anteriorly displaced disc that is not on top of the head of the condyle is an obstruction. It's in the way. It blocks. But as the patient moves that condyle forward, translates, the disc actually pops back onto the top where it belongs. Usually makes a click, like a big click. And then it goes back on. So you'll hear the click right where it starts turning back the right way. You may hear it, you may not hear it, but usually this is an anteriorly displaced disc without, with, with reduction, with reduction. I mean, when you say reduction, it means the disc is popping back into the right place. We get into a lot of, I think in the 80s, we got crazy about discs and clicking and you know, everything was putting a stethoscope and feeling the click and when was the click and blah, blah. Well, I'm just, you know, I just want to document that there's a problem. So where is the problem in the right joint? What's the problem? It doesn't translate well. What happens though? At some point, it starts to translate. 
So the right joint doesn't translate and it deflects and then all of a sudden the disc pops back on and it translates and corrects and goes back to the center. Got it? So here is the opposite problem. The left joint only rotates and as the patient open it only rotates. At some point the disc goes back into place, click, and you start translating evenly on both sides and end up back to the center. Got it? So the part where it's going to the left is where there is a deflection. Then it goes back to the right when translation starts. Translation starts when the disc pops back into place. So in TMD, the word reduction is used to mean that the articular disc, which goes between the mandibular fossa, the bosome, and the condyle, goes back into its correct position, had to be not in the correct position previously, means that the articular disc goes back into its correct position on top of the mandibular condyle and the that condyle can now translate got it reduction is a orthopedic term meaning the bone doctor so when you break a leg the process of reduction means putting the leg back together in its correct place putting the break back exactly fitting together so the bone is at its correct length in its correct position got it then the doctor puts a cast on takes an x-ray checks to make sure the bone is right back in the right place. So a reduction is when the disc goes back into place. So I say in TMD because, you know, the, the word reduction is a orthopedic term, meaning putting bones together. But the articular disc is made out of fibrocartilage, not cartilage, so it can heal. Knee cartilage cannot heal but our disc can heal, hallelujah. And in TMD, the term anteriorly displaced disc with reduction, with reduction, it is gonna go back into place, means that the articular disc goes back into its correct position on top of the mandibular condyle after being not in the right position, got it? And when it's not in the right position, you get deflection. When it's in the correct position, you get a opening to the midline. So now you've graduated a little bit, you kind of know what's going on. So I want you to look at this crazy devi deviation. It's not a deflection. Deflection is to one side with a straight line that does not return to the center. This is a crazy double, uh, double like, movement, double, deflection with correction, but all at the end, ending up back in the midline. So let's kind of figure out what's going on. So as the person first open, they deflect to the right. That means the right joint is anteriorly displaced without reduction. Then all of a sudden, the disc pops back into place and it returns back to normal, but it kind of starts normal, but it keeps on, now it starts deflecting to the opposite side. Wait a minute. The left joint now, the left joint, the disc pops back into place and it straightens out. And you're going to hear two clicks on this if you're thinking about clicks. Not that I care about clicks as much anymore because our treatment, regardless, when you put the joint back into the correct place, three-dimensionally, these things often heal. About 75% will heal. And uh, it doesn't make the disc perfect back to when you're 18 years old, but the healing within the disc is enough to cause correct motion of the jaw. In other words, they'll have this, we'll treat them, we look back at them in six months, they're opening straight. Oh, Lord of money. Why are they opening straight? Didn't they have a problem with their discs? Yeah, but it's healed within there. You might say, does the disc pop back into place? Yes and no. The, it, the, it, the healing inside the joint 
allows the joint to function because the movement of the jaw is forming that disc back again. And it, it doesn't matter what it does. Some people call it a pseudo disc. Pseudo means false. Like you have the amoeba, have pseudopodia, false legs. But the, all we know is it heals and we're happy. Patient's out of pain, patient can open. But this is a double dislocation with a double reduction. Got it? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I hope you got that. Uh, you've got enough in your head, you should be able to understand it. All right. And TMD, and again, I say TMD because you, you hear me say this in orthopedics. You talk to an or, uh, orthopedic surgeon, he's going to think you're crazy because you're talking about bones. And But anyhow, reduction has to do with bones normally. But in TMD, the term anteriorly displaced without reduction, without not coming back, means that the articular disc does not go back into the correct position on top of the mandibular condyle. What does this mean? You have a deflection with no returning to the middle. Got it? But you can have a anterior displaced disc with reduction, and at the point it reduces, it starts going back to normal movement. Got it? Very important. So here is a not uncommon clinical situation which demands immediate treatment. And this is called an acute, which means sudden, closed, they can't open, they're closed, they can't open. Acute, closed, locked, they're locked, they can't open, it's locked, unable to open the door. Acute closed lock is when the patient cannot open their, their, their jaw. And this means almost always that there's damage in one or both of the joints. Typically, there's damage of the articular disc. It no longer has the correct shape. It's tore up and it is displaced. So you typically have an anterior displaced disc without reduction. It slips forward. What I worry about is when the disc slips forward, it could fold up like a sandwich on itself, like a pita. And if it is not reduced back into place, that folding up on itself could cause fusion and permanently, basically permanently screw up the shape of that disc. So anteriorly displaced discs must be treated immediately to avoid the disc going forward, slipping and curling up on itself. Also, there's ligamental damage. We know the ligaments hold the disc in place, and those ligaments have been stretched and stretched and stretched, and they don't return back to their original shortened length. So they can't hold the disc in place anymore. The disc can slip around more than it normally would and as the person struggles and forces their jaw one side to the other, trying to open, they start ripping these ligaments. And so you want to treat this as soon as possible. You're not going to believe this. I had a patient come in the other day who hadn't been treated for three months. She's been locked, sucking through a straw, eating smoothies and oatmeal and eggs, and she couldn't eat. And I was like, why did you wait so long? So the longer you wait, the more chance there's damage, right? And then you may need later arthroscopy, which is when you're putting little tubes into that joint by an oral surgeon and cleaning out that joint, and that's minimal surgery. But let me tell you, treat the acute, acute closed lock immediately. Either do it yourself, refer to me, please. This is a critical issue. This is where I see a lot of problems that can occur. It's also quite distressing for patients. They, you know, they can't open and they're like, what is happening to me? I'm out of control in my body. But what is this? Uh, usually it, it's one or both of the joints has an anterior displaced disc without reduction. And then because the joint is being pinched, the joint is being irritated, the masseter muscles or elevator muscles clamp up to prevent movement because every time you move, you damage, you hurt the disc, you hurt the joint. 
So the, the body does not want movement when a, a disc anterior displaces. That means that the condyle is going back and crushing, destroying the back part of the joint, the tender, soft tissues. So you will lock up. So now that you're a pro and you kind of know what's going on in the joints, I'm going to present the situation, a scenario to you, and I want you to think. So here you've got a patient coming in and they can't open, right? Right? If a closed lock patient can move 8 to 10 millimeters to the right, right lateral, 8 to 10 millimeters to the left, left lateral, that means that both temporal mandibular joints are normal. There is not a displaced disc, right? Very important. However, patient's right in front of you and they can't open. So if the patient cannot open, it's because there is muscle shortening. We used to say spasm, but they don't, spasm means shaking. It's not spasm, it's muscle tightness. Got it? Uh, we, or you could say trismus, uh, that's a good word, muscle trismus. And um, so if a patient cannot open, when you can move right and left eight to 10, it's because there is muscle shortening and the muscles, not the joints, are preventing this opening. Got it? Now, when you see a acute closed lock, it's not just the anterior displaced disc, it's the muscles also that are in, that are in trismus and the patient's in pain. There's a psychological component. You know, there's a physical component. There's pain because the muscles are contracted so long that they get no more blood and they start building up lactic acid. Right, there's all this stuff happening, and also the joints are irritated. But again, you have to say, is this a acute closed lock that's due to anterior displaced disc? Anterior displaced disc? Well, if uh, yes, if it if if they can't move right and left properly, yeah. But if they can, no, this is muscles. So I'm throwing this one in. This is really not related to measurements because sometimes we get something called an acute sudden open lock. So the person's jacked open and they cannot close. They can't close. They're sitting there moving around. They're trying to close. They can't close. Got it? That's called an acute open lock. What is that? That's not a disc problem. Listen, listen. It's an anterior displaced mandibular condyle. The whole bone of the condyle is out of the socket. It goes forward out of the socket. Got it? You've probably seen people that can take their arm and move over to the left, go out of their socket, right? So an acute open lock is an anteriorly displaced mandibular condyle, right? And the condyle is out of the socket, it has come forward out of the front of the socket and come up and it won't go back. It's so interesting, and there I do have a manual on how to reduce, get that term again, reduce an open lock. In other words, get the condyle back into the mandibular fossa. Mandibular fossa, a fossa is like a dome, mand, uh, the dome of the mandible, and the condyle goes back into that dome, that bony dome, and that is called reducing the anterior open lock or uh, acute open lock. The, again, as I said, I have an instructor manual on dealing with this and also dealing with, with acute closed locks and how to deal with that. Simple manual. Um, you want to read it. It'd be good, right? All right. Thank you. Well, in conclusion, I want to thank you for watching the video, please, you know, look at it again, get a ruler, start measuring your fellow staff, measure the uh, patients, think, think, think about what's going on inside those joints. There's a lot more to this. This is, believe it or not, you know, 75% of everything you need to know. There are other special situations uh, that we do see, uh, but I'm giving you the most common situations, the most common interpretations of unusual jaw movements and measurements. But the Atlanta TMD is my lifelong passion. 
is where I want to end up. I'm currently going to be 68. I would like to pass this information on. That is my real strong desire. And I need your help because I want you to learn about TMD. I want you to be passionate or at least let other people know about it. Support the, the Institute by sending patients. We want you to treat the patients. And if you want to learn, we'll teach you. But you don't want to send them to us. That allows us to pay the bills and do what we're wanting to do, which is also doing research in such areas as tardive dyskinesia and other areas where there's really unusual speech problems, stuttering. We've treated patients like this successfully. And there's also medical dental references for these things. We just need to make this knowledge everywhere. And again, uh, thank you. And again, the, the Institute educates people, which is what we're doing with you right now, developing knowledge, the books that we're writing and video. And we're there also to take care of patients that you're not comfortable with uh, or to help you treat them. So thanks again. I'm very appreciative to you for supporting the Institute. Please start taking measurements. Teach your assistants to do it. Teach the hygienist to do it. Anybody and then start thinking about what's happening inside the joints. Thank you. Uh, be safe.